Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome to this afternoon session of Project Micro HE. Uh, as you can see in my uh, shared screen, this uh, session is titled Technology Powering the Future of Micro-Credentials. Uh, we are going to focus on the micro-credentials and the technology demonstrator that was developed within the project micro -AG, uh, which we are going to do in the second part of, the, um, of this session. Uh, we are going to start with Mitya Ermol in his role of UNESCO Chair in uh, Open Educational Resources and Open Education to give us um, a little bit of an overview, I believe, in technologies and how these kind of technologies and micro-credentials in the end also relate to open education um, and so that we can place uh, these technologies in the whole scope of the educational system. Uh, as the last part, the last half an hour of this session, uh, we will invite you to explore the technology uh, the technology demonstrator, excuse me, and uh, you will be invited to give feedback. So there will be no breakout rooms. We are going to uh, invite you to communicate with us directly via chat. And for the last part, we are also going to ask you to uh, activate your microphones and uh, let's have a conversation uh, and then make some notes of it. Okay, so Mitya, if you're ready, I'll hand over the screen to you. Okay, am I live now? Yes. Can you see this? Right, yes, so, okay, so uh, thank you very much for having me here. So the, um, as Michaela said already, so I, I am one of the uh, seven, eight now, eight UNESCO chairs on open educational resources. So uh, what we do and what we promote is essentially um, content, educational content that follows the open source idea so that you can take, uh, reblend, reshelve, make something else out of it and then put it back to the community. Now, uh, but what I also do here at the Institute is, of course, research and development in, in the artificial intelligence, and in this particularly fits pretty much, pretty well into the education era, area. So um, what I wanted to tell you today a little bit is uh, some of the things that we do, and in particular, what, um, what is there as a landscape in open education, and why something like credential and micro-credentials are actually needed. So somehow setting up the scene for the next talks. And I will, I will start with, with this, right? Because um, in any way, and we've seen that in particular now in this uh, pandemic crisis that whatever we developed in 17th century as an educational system doesn't really fit anymore to what we're doing today. And if, you, if you're frank to yourself and think about how we are actually teaching kids, is that we are teaching kids with the mechanisms that we develop, so teach for the 20th century. Uh, uh, we developed um, uh, mechanisms in, um, in uh, 18th, uh, 17th century, which actually doesn't really uh, follow anymore the requirements, the, the, the needs, the motivation, and all necessary things in order to education to be uh, enjoyable. So, uh, so instead of having this mechanistic system, uh, what we have as an option because we are now being overly connected through several different sorts of networks, not just not just technology connections, but also all the other networks, is that we certainly have an option to create something which is a completely different thing. So, imagine a Imagine that you have everything what we have today open, and that all that is open, uh, uh, all that is closed today would be open and accessible to anybody, to any individual in the globe. And since we are certainly able to understand and to see the individual and his needs and his preferences and everything that he does in 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 terms of uh, expectations, uh, personal goals, uh, development goals, 
would actually be supported by something which is a completely open and adaptive social environment in learning, that would be a completely different source of education. So if you, for example, check, imagine that you will have all this what is here open. So there are more than 1.2 million schools in the world. You don't know them. We don't know them. We usually, usually you know just about the school which is close to your, your door, close to your neighborhood, which is your, in your town, but in most other schools you don't know. There are more than 20,000 higher educational um, uh, entities in the globe. There are 80, more than 80 million teachers. So just imagine what would 80 million teachers, if you would be able to get any type of question or any type of information answered, uh, how much of this information you can get from 80 million teachers globally. There are more than 1,700 distance learning environments available. There is one, uh, 1,500 virtual laboratories in the globe. So I know, you know, I, I've experienced four of them. I don't know for all the others, but certainly this is something which is a resource. In most cases, close. I know nobody is using that because there is no need on one side and on the other side there is no uh, ability we don't there is no um, entry point to all this lab so that people will eventually know that this is possible there are more than 400,000 libraries in the world there is till now in all so humanity till now published one over 130 million books out of those 130 million books there are 1.45 million textbooks published do we know about those they are there they are stored uh, some of those they are accessible some of those they are not accessible for the oer content so we know that for these open education resources there is more than 2 billion bits and pieces scattered across the globe and we don't know where they are and how they can get accessed to. There are more than 5.7 million of Wikipedia articles. For, for DBpedia, you have 4.5 million already and it's growing up constantly. You have structured databases, structured knowledge bases. For example, Psych is one of the largest, which has 450,000 concepts in a huge network of, of um, semantic network of relations, so concept with the relations connected to, to each other that actually allows computers also to do reasoning. You have two and point, more than 2.5 million scientific papers published per year. I mean, how many, how many each of us is actually reading? How many, how many of this information you can get? Uh, it's completely impossible. It's completely impossible to have access to all of these things because they are just too many and they're just scattered across and it's just too many things that you can essentially grasp as an individual and all the other stuff. So I didn't know that there are more than 27,000 TV channels available. And out of those 27,000 TV channels, there are just few of them devoted to learning. So uh, this is just a snapshot uh, about learning applications. And there are, you know, thousands and thousands of learning applications. So people today are actually using and thinking about the open education as something which is, you know, could be accessible. And those are open universities, open accreditation, open context, MOOCs. You've heard about the open software, open access, open curricula, open source, open licenses. So everything actually is labeled as open, but essentially doesn't really mean that this is open. Uh, the problem with, with, um, with uh, the current state of, of openness is that it's still uh, perceived as um, this is a kind of, a, you know, a hippie movement of these strange people that are trying to change the world. This is how it's actually everything what you say open is perceived to because it's not linked directly to something which is a concrete financial added value. It's linked to something which is in a different type of added value. The problem that is also is that actually people are not looking at this open education as something which would be a, an addition to that. And in particularly, what are these open environments? What is the open organization? Imagine that you would have, for example, today an option as a, as a student in a school to just change your classroom. You get into 
mathematics and you said, oh, it's very boring for me right now. I want to go to listen to a little bit of history because this is something I want to, I'm interested in. So things which actually are just being pushed down from, um, from the basics saying that those are the things that people have to learn. And if you check kids how they learn today, they learn completely different. They go, they do that in parallel, so they, 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 they do things in parallel. Uh, uh, they, they check videos, they don't read text anymore. They go for videos, they, they, you know, when there is a question, they go for YouTube. They are not, they are not searching anymore to text, they are searching the YouTube video, how to deal with it, how to do it, how to develop it. So, very rapid and very fast exception of, of different sorts of, of knowledge, and those are the things that are actually changing completely our, uh, let's say, the, the old generation style of, of, um, of, of, of learning. So the, the things that are actually really changing is that the kids or the new generations are looking for something which is the open, openness, open access, open borders. So going from one school to another without anybody questioning you why you're getting into this or you know, studying in a different country. So why, why this is a problem? I mean, this is something which actually is not really a case uh, anymore for, um, for the country, it's a case for the humanity. So those are the things that are certainly there. And so this imaginative um, future uh, open education that actually uh, tackles everything what is there available and provide everything what is there available in an open manner to every particular individual is a very complex thing. So certainly you as a professor, and this is what if we've seen, for example, in your parents of, of MOOCs, you know, the first, the first massive online open courses had like 150,000 students and more. So how can you actually, you know, how can you serve or how can you actually um, teach 150,000 students as a professor in a one-to-one -one -one manner. It's completely impossible. So the question then is, of course, do we have solutions there that may actually happen, uh, help that this would happen? So on one side, to understand uh, what we have there as a content. So grasp all this content, structure the content, understand the information which is there, being completely completely um, 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 agnostic to, to languages, to culture. So something that actually would provide you with a very easy, uh, uh, very easy in time, in the right manner, uh, um, access to, to learning content, to learning resources that might be relevant for you today. And then on the other side, how can you understand 150,000 students? What is the particular student doing right now? Where, are these, where, where, where is the problem? Where, how can you help as a professor? How can you help as a system to a particular student which is right now doing teaching and learning and whatever uh, 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 collaborative, collaborative work? So those are the things that certainly can be done already. And you know, if you go to any, any um, online, online shop, in any online shop, you will be immediately modeled and, and classified uh, immediately. So why don't we just use all these technologies for learning, for example? And then on the other side, you have, you have teacher, of course, that is somehow trying to manage this process, so between the learning and the content. And uh, of course, he cannot do it without uh, really understanding what is going on. And of course, if you put that in the context of all these open resources, uh, which is not, as I said, just content or just software, but also, let's say, open schools, open borders, whatever open, uh, how can, how can uh, something that would be a system that will support uh, this personalization of learning, uh, how can this look like? So this is what we actually do uh, in, uh, in the development and research in the, in the area of AI. So this is what actually are the three main things that we are doing in, in AI uh, when we're th thinking about the education. On one side, I said content understanding, user modeling, and then real-time real -time personalization. Now, imagine that this would be possible. 
So imagine that we would be able to, on one side, do automatic ingestion of all these resources from, so I said, from videos to texts, to, uh, from video, from content to resources to teachers to programs to whatever, right? Whatever. On the other side, being able to understand any particular individual. So understand not just about what is his current status, what is his background knowledge, but also understand what are his her intentions, what are his her um, uh, goals, what are his her aspirations, what actually is the next step that this particular person would want to go. For example, imagine that you are today a kid in a primary school and you want to be a chef, and then you will say, okay. My goal is to be a chef in a you know a very specific, very good chef that will be doing perfect meals for a perfect persons globally. And then, since we understand that this is the goal, that this is aspiration, since we understand that there is uh, a lot of resources that can help this kid to become a chef, we can certainly create his uh, career path, adjust a proposal to his career path. And then, if you are able to to understand uh, so the, the, how this particular person is actually following this career path, and usually as it is with the kids, the next year the kid will say, well, I don't really want to be a chef anymore, I want to be an astronaut. So what would that mean for a career path? How can you actually structure the complete ecosystem around this particular kid that will actually serve this particular need to being an astronaut? So those are the things that actually lead to something which will this act, uh, adaptive learning educational environment, which is a completely different thing. Now, we did, and we are doing quite a lot of things already. So one of the projects, and um, uh, we can have a special talk on that sometime, uh, is about a complete uh, learning resources open pipeline. So automatically, really automatically, gathering all this information. So go, gathering all this information about, uh, so from the ingestion phase to, to understand, uh, to get over cross-lingual, cross-model with, well, with semantic processes, um, that we do quality processing as well. So uh, being aware of if a particular either uh, competence or the, or the software or uh, application, or uh, content is really high quality or it's really relevant of relevant quality for a particular user and then of course if you understand this how what is the didactic uh, design and pedagogical value so this is something which actually is a um, work in progress but we are pretty much far away already so something that would provide anybody access to all these resources one thing the other thing as it is today, you have various different websites. Uh, as I said, so you can end up with um, with a website on, on MIT, and then you start with the website on, on online learning in, um, in, um, in Ljubljana, and then the next one would be in UCL and so on. So th those are the things that are happening today, but the most, the problem is that those are the isolated sites. So what we want to do and what we are doing also in one of these projects is how could you actually connect all these websites in a one environment? This could not only be websites, it could be also schools in a kind of the same way. So how can you make out of all these resources a common, understandable, adaptive environment? And this is what we do. So we are actually developing, we have developed a, a very simple snippet, which gives any website across the globe ability to add a cross recommendation, cross recommendation engine. So your website is becoming a part of the global online education by just adding this simple snippet into the website, which will actually then showing on your website what are the relevant content on all the other websites across the globe for your particular user. And this will happen all across the other websites, which would mean that essentially you will have 
you have the in any type in any website you you log in you have the same type of recommendation which actually fits then either in your personal uh, development or in a similarity or curricula so different sorts of um, different sorts of criteria to which this recommendation will be done but this is how actually then you show on every website all the other content on all the other websites this is another thing that we do and it's of course quite a lot of um, machine learning behind then um, user modeling user modeling we did that already as i said for commercial uh, for commercial sh um, um, shops already online shops already in years ago so this is not something that is actually new this is something that is just adapting the tools that we have to do uh, personalization so modeling of the user understanding learning teaching behavior incentives background knowledge all those things that are necessary for the system to connect the current status of a person to all these resources which are available that I've shown in the previous slides. Competency calculation, you can do that, that automatically. So it's not that you, it's not that there are no tools that they can actually calculate competence based on resources that you can find out about, about each particular person. It's not something that is very difficult anymore. It's something that is actually existing. And those competencies are then can be then connected together with the network of uh, learning paths, and those learning paths are then used to understand actually why, where the particular person is right now, and what are the next steps that we have to learn. So how can you then actually, based on this, create learning pathways? And this is what we also do. So those are the things that actually exist. So all these bits and pieces of this longer. Uh, pipeline for doing for do this global um, learning personalization are actually available it's not something that is being should be done or is um, uh, or, or we think that it it might be done now the next level I want to show you is actually a um, a AI that goes into this level if you if uh, if you remember the the slide that I have when I showed the triangle between the teacher, learner, and the content, when you would say, okay, so what actually, if this is all this content there available, what a good AI can do? So 15 years ago with, um, with uh, uh, Psych, so Psych was um, a project in early 80s where, uh, AI experts wanted to codify the complete human knowledge and create the real, the real AI. So codifying would mean that experts sat down and actually constructed this huge ontology of all the concepts and all the relations that are actually part of the human common sense knowledge. And this thing grow up, grew up to... Um, um, to a large, a large uh, semantic network, knowledge network, right now with more than 450,000 concepts. So, for example, the Encyclopedia Britannica, the last Encyclopedia Britannica had 350,000. Now, you can, of course, imagine that all these concepts are connected with billions of different types of relations between each other. And this thing can actually certainly, what it's, it's doing, is certainly doing reasoning and talking to you through the natural language processing machine in a natural language. So what we are thinking about, and those are the things, for example, what it can produce. So out from this network, wow, out of this huge um, knowledge network, you can get uh, sentences like this. So those are the sentences automatically produced out of the semantic network. So everything is there already available. It's just that what we are thinking about and what could be an addition to what we've said before is not just about providing the personalization of learning, but it's more like uh, thinking about the machine, thinking about the AI as a as a body, as a uh, equal um, on equal footing. So, what and how it will look like if we would teach the AI and AI would teach us back. So, not just 
taking all the existing content, all the existing knowledge, all the existing resources available um, in the globe, but also actually finding out all the hidden knowledge which is there in the heads of individuals. So the, 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 the prototype that we developed already uh, years ago was able to automatically learn concepts, the concepts you've seen before, so automatically learn concepts from available resources and then checking these concepts according to what is there written in the web. So not everything that you've, you can grasp from, from, um, uh, from available resources would be necessary true. So you have to check whether this is true or not. So you can do checking directly by asking queries and putting queries to, to, the, to the resource, to, to, so to the web. But on the other side, you can actually ask people. So how it looks like is, for example, uh, the question that I will get is the question in natural language from this main globe, global system. So you can imagine this is only one. So there is one it. One it that is actually asking question to any individual in the globe about the things it doesn't know. But this is not being done in a scattered way. So it will be done in a way that since we said already that we understand what is the status, what is the background knowledge of a particular individual. So I will not ask, I will not ask somebody about the black holes since, I don't know, I, since I'm pretty sure that he doesn't know about black holes, but I will ask a person who is an expert about the black holes, about what black holes are. And now the question that actually the system is asking to individuals are not only based on his in individual expertise or competencies, but also about the larger context in which this individual is appearing. So for example, the question right now would be to me, since I'm sitting here at the Institute, and since the, the, this global thing knows that the Institute is a entity, and this is a research entity, and this is, since it is a research entity, it has to have a director, it has to have a research agenda, it has to have a department, it has to be in a building, it has to be um, a, a central entity. So the things that actually, under, so the, the, as, a, as a high level concept, the AI knows, but particularly, particularity informations, it doesn't know. So the question, for example, for me right now would be, okay, Mitya, since you're sitting right now at the Oja Stefan Institute, and since I know that the Institute has to have a director, can you tell me, since I don't know, who is the director of the Institute? So the contextualized information. And I would say, okay, so this is the director of the Institute, is this person, this person. And of course, uh, this thing will actually gather this information, but then still will go to check whether I was right. So, and checking would be done through, let's say, available resources or asking somebody who is actually in the same context as me, whether Mitya was lying or not. Not actually saying that Mitya was lying, but asking a question, is it true that this person is being a director or not? And this is something that actually then can be done directly to different, different uh, sources available on the web, available in this open learning, but also all the information that people can provide to a global whole. And of course, the idea is not that this would be a closed system. The idea, again, that this would be an open source, open knowledge AI that will actually then use everything that is gathering from different sources to individual, again, in a personalized way. So those are the just few of the, of the elements that we are working on. Some of the things that actually have been already prototypes and tested already in the practice. But essentially, uh, this what if, what if uh, um, uh, um, uh, slides looks like as it is today, uh, right now uh, in, our, in, our, in our environment. Now, uh, if this everything would be done, the one question which reminds is how can you, what can you do with all this open learning? So how actually can you provide a clear and relevant 
and uh, structured information about the competencies that each particular individual has gathered. Since we will have all this information about uh, what courses each particular individual has attended, what websites actually has been checked, what what was uh, what, what what has been done in his history. Certainly, what is needing is something which is a standardized approach to provide and to create something like a global competency, global knowledge passport. And for those things like micro credentials and micro qualifications are needed. And this is why we started also this project um, years ago. And with this project in years ago, we actually developed the prototype as well, running already, that could support this other, the other part of, of this online learning. And as, as I said, so everything, what, what we are showing, what we are demonstrating is here, it's available, we've developed it, we've tested it. It's just about having an agreement. So having an agreement whether we really want to go into that direction or not. This could be done, of course, easily in informal learning, but if you go and whenever you go to the formal learning, uh, and in particular in the uh, tackling with the national policies, national education assistance, then uh, things become completely different. So my message is that um, we are doing that, we are involved in that. Um, it's not just us, it's not just the institutes, it's a lot of people across the globe are working on that. Um, we are, as I, as I said, so we are very closely related to UNESCO. There is quite a lot of things going on on the UNESCO side. There is quite a lot of things going on the UN general side. There is quite a lot of things in that direction going on the, in the EU level, uh, African Union as well. So people are certainly thinking about the same issues, same, about the same issues. It's just about how we can actually make push things forward and make it happen in terms of either a, um, let's say, a, a larger pilot or uh, even a global, global implementation. Here are some of the websites, uh, some of the links that you can check, all the stuff I've showed. Um, you can see who we are, what we do. And in particular, this is actually an invitation to you to, to get to display and then actually to move things forward on. So this would be, uh, this is what I wanted to tell you. Thank you, Mitya. Uh, everyone listening, uh, please send your questions for anything related to Mitya's talk uh, on the chat. Uh, I have made a note of two questions for you, Mitya. Um, the first one is, uh, is from Tina Anderson, and it was uh, posted at the time when you were explaining the. Um, uh, how the integration of the snippet uh, connects OER sites. And the question is, uh, what about the competition between uh, providers? So I understand this, what about the competition between open education resources providers? So open education resources are meant to be, in an essence, to be open and accessible to anybody. So all are more or less Everybody we know from this OER is looking at um, making their resources available to everybody. So there is a genuine interest to, to share, to join, uh, to make something um, which will be available to everybody. So we are, uh, this idea of, um, of, um, of this snippet, so this cross recommendation is about actually solving or uh, um, supporting the the plan and the ideas and the and, 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 uh, um, and the plans of these sites to get together so it's not that we would have problems with them um, thinking about that this is um, my proprietary proprietary content okay so I guess this is uh, solving the uh, commitment to the open education community to enhance access relate not related to yeah. who is the actual provider or the okay I, I, okay I, I hope this answers the first question of uh, Tina Anderson and the second question um, by the same participant is um, how does personalization relate to privacy 
and individual choice and expression. Yeah, quite a lot, of course, this is an issue, certainly. Yeah. Now, um, what is also true is that what we learned from, from all the projects we did in the past is that um, you, you have, at the end of the day, you have limited number of different uh, types of learning individuals. So if you group them, this would not be, this would not be um, uh, really each particular person, but that will be groups of individuals. So if you go in that direction and say, okay, so I'm using this personal, personal information to create those groups without actually then tackling directly to a particular person, then you are solving part of this problem, but not completely. So we are aware of this, of this issue. We are dealing with this issue as well. Uh, it's just that we say uh, right now, uh, the, probably the most uh, effective way to do it would be to stay on a level of a groups of individuals for which we don't know who these groups are. But certainly then that could provide already enough personalization to those particular individuals uh, so that you can actually then divide also things, saying that on one side you provide these groups and on the other side, which is in a private mode, you have all these uh, uh, specifics that are then fit to a particular individual. So no, no data, personalized data actually goes, uh, is being misused or used for modeling and on the other side, no personal data is then being um, used outside of your personal environment, which would be either your your phone or either your computer, laptop, or whatever. But we are dealing with this, so this is an issue, certainly. Uh, I guess this also relates to the second part of the question about individual choice. Um, I understand this question as a kind of a, a balance of recommending with learning yeah. pathways and having the individual to choose. The author so of the it's, question it's, can correct me. Okay, exactly like this. So uh, whatever what we do, it's not, it's not a system that will actually direct you to do something. It's about providing you relevant choices. So uh, let's say instead of reading 1.3 million uh, scientific papers every year, you can read the most five most relevant that are suitable just for what you do and what your intentions. So those are the things that we do. So providing you a ranked list of options and then it's usually, it's always like people actually then decide whether to use these recommendations or not. It's not, of course, not necessary. This is something just as a help that, that follows the a larger context that actually took into consideration also the history of the individual, not just the current status. Okay. Okay. Can I speak? <laughs> um, oh, hello. Yes. Hello. <laughs> it's it's me who asked that question. Um, I'm maybe I'm too old, but I'm uh, the the type of learner uh, or the type of consumer that gets incredibly annoyed by uh, a web shop suggesting me to <laughs> buy something uh, on the basis of what I just bought. Other people like you bought this also. So I, I was really, I, was, I could feel uh, annoyance bubbling up during <laughs> your talk because, mm -hmm. uh, well, it's, it's, it's kind of nice to have things suggested to you, but it's also annoying uh, that... Uh, there, you know that there are other things which are not suggested and which you might find interesting. And uh, my hypothesis would be that there would be other people out there having these sensations about choice, if you understand what I Of course, of course. So the, the question would be, uh, uh, maybe, maybe I can ask you a question. So if you have the ability to switch off this recommendation, would you be happy? I would be happier. <laughs> exactly. This is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So this is just a, a help. You mm -hmm. can use it or not. It's up to yeah. you then at the end of the day. Yeah. But it's a help. Yes. But uh, the, the way you presented it, it's, it, it sounded all very top down and uh, no, no, sort no. of society decides for you what you're going to learn no, 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 in no. the shape of this uh, big AI 
black no, hole no. AI. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not. It's not like this. Uh, certainly not. Uh, as I said, so um, everything that we do in AI in general, it's about decision support. It's about supporting, or let's say, having a more informed decisions, providing yes. you better understanding of where you are, what you do, what you might be going to do. But then it's at the end of the day, it's up to you. And of course, you can use this help or you, you just don't use it. I mean, it's always up to you. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, we have one more question in the chat um, from Corinne. And I think we are going to address it a bit later on when we are going to explore the technology, um, specifically develop the micro-credentials. But maybe, Mitya, you can give your input. So the question is, how adaptive is the current micro-credential framework you mentioned? Um, adaptive, so the, the adaptation would be, could have several several layers so one is the adaptation of the software the other one is adaptation of the model the first one would be the adaptation of um of the content of this model so those are the things i mean usually whatever that you do whatever when you when whatever you are developing uh, any type of software you want to be as adaptive as possible so um structuring things using the technologies that are actually able uh, enabling you to to adapt things in a less harmful way with with less energy put in so those are this is you know this is something which is inherent in in whatever what we do except for you know when you go to to the complete automatic system uh, automatic uh, let's say automatic um um, um manufacturing lines and all this stuff for where you don't need really this uh, adaptation flexibility but here certainly everything that is there is uh, it's open to the way that could be adapted not very easily but as easily as possible okay thank you i think an example is of this is coming right after this mm -hmm. uh, q a uh, is there any more questions maybe at this point Corinne is saying thank you. Um, okay, so I suggest if there's no more questions, I suggest we go to the second part of our talk. Thank you, Mitya. So thank far, you. thank you. Okay. So now we would like to move the this workshop to a practical part of it which is the presentation of the technology demonstrator, which is going to be presented by Davor Orlic from Knowledge for All Foundation, one of the partners of the micro HE project, uh, with which we developed the solutions together. Um, Davor, are you ready? Hi, everyone. Yes, I am. Okay, Davor, so I'm going to stop my screen share and you take over. I'm just uh, warning everyone that Davor does not has his, uh, have his... Uh, camera working, but uh, please don't let that stop you to post questions in the chat. Yeah, I'm too good looking to have a camera. I'm sorry for that. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. I just want to say hi to the people that I know of who are on the call. So hi, Johan. Then I know Sandra. Uh, Vesna, hi. Um, Ildiko. Um, Mm, probably Raimund. Hi, Raimund. Well, Mitya, of course. Um, you guys can always pitch in if you want. Um, this should be uh, it should be a conversation rather than me just um, hammering out what we've done. So feel free to ask questions um, in real time and have your mics on. Shouldn't be a problem. Um, let me first start by sharing my screen. Um, and start essentially from the last question. Last question was a micro-credentials framework. So if I go and I start and I open a new window, right? If I go for the micro-credentials website, what we've done 
or at least the part of the project that we were heavily involved in is this one, right? So you've seen presentations throughout the day on this, on these topics, and there's one more session behind us, sorry, in front of us, um, but we've done this. So we created a metadata standard that would be the backbone of an online clearinghouse. Um, that would be the essentially the um, technical backbone of something that would enable institutions to share and exchange. So create, share, um, um, and present uh, digital credentials, or at least micro credentials, right, uh, along the way. Um, let's just kick it off from here. Let's just kick it off from this side. Um, if I go and I get a new window, um, the what we've done with the with the with the micro credentials um, thingy on um, the backbone is the metadata standard. So what you're looking at is very is one of the biggest portals in terms of software exchange and software collaboration, um, which is probably not very uh, common to teachers and faculty or even students, maybe students of computer science. Um, and we have described our micro credentials metadata standard, right? So this was a public draft. Let me drop this in the um, in the comments in the chat so you guys can see this live. Oh, sorry, um, everyone, this. So the idea is that we have gone through um, the metadata of what should describe digital credentials, right? So this is not something that we came up with. This is something, I mean, obviously this is, but this is an enhanced version of what already existed. If you went through the um, description of the workshop, then we also mentioned the ESCO ontology. So what we have done is we've also, if I go for the first link, we've also introduced the micro-credentials extension into the ESCO ontology. So the ESCO ontology, something powered by the European Commission, and it's basically a, a classification of uh, jobs, competencies, uh, um, so skills, I've got it, skills, competencies, qualifications, and occupations. So this is the backbone across Europe for companies, educational institutions, ministries, uh, national governments, when they discuss, um, when they discuss interoperability across Europe in terms of skills, occupation, and qualifications. And we've inserted the micro-credentials concept, should I say, into this ontology. So this is our starting point, right? So this, sorry, the website. Um, geez. So this is our starting point. And if I go back, this is basically the backbone on which we are building a very nice application. So, are there any questions at this point? No questions. Right? Not so far, Davor. Okay. Let's then go for the slides. So we're going to have a couple of slides, then I'll share those slides with you, and then we can move onwards, right? So I'm with the Knowledge for All Foundation, which promotes the open access to academic resources combining artificial intelligence tools um, to give users access to these resources and to match them to their needs. Something similar that Mitya mentioned before. So we also help overcome the barriers of limited discoverability and accessibility, hence our work in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of AI and education and, um, um, and other machine learning uh, topics. But education is always at the crossroad for that and capacity building. So with MicroHE, we had a very simple idea, right? How do you create a standard format for documenting micro-credentials or digital credentials 
in terms of ECTSs using existing recognition tools. So what would happen in the US is that the Code of Americans, they would just come up with uh, something new and then that would be, you know, the disruption. It doesn't really work in Europe. In Europe, you've got the, uh, the ESCO um, tool, you've got the EQF, NQF, all of that stuff which is combined, uh, which combined makes sense across, across countries. So we had to build on that so that it would make sense. So our task was to create a prototype for Digital Credentials Clearinghouse. Um, on top of our metadata standard with the purpose, with the purpose to cater a scalability uh, uh, application for you know thousands of institutions. So we extended that with other available standards and open source um, uh, um, solutions and we simply call it credentify.eu. Um, could have been anything else, but we just chose credentify.eu. Um, so this is where you should go and check things out. So this is the website, credentify.eu. Basically, you type it in your um, browsers and we should kick it off from there. Uh, it's a very basic website, so don't worry, nothing complicated. So Credentify allows the exchange of any type of digital credentials between you and your university, if you're a student, right? So let's say you're a student, including, you know, formal, non-formal, and informal settings. So that means, you know, open educational, um, scenarios or open schooling scenarios all the way up to you know higher education as the project wants it um, obviously it allows safe transfer of credentials as smaller units this is the juice of it so stackable units fast dynamic safe reliable transparent and accountable this is what we claim we've done which is probably true to a certain extent and obviously we have used blockchain but don't really pay attention to the blockchain. This is really a, we've done A, B, C, D, uh, comma, blockchain. So um, it's really a, a, a ubiquitous technology at this point, nothing to worry about, because I know that in educational, um, in, in an educational context, it, it, it has potentially uh, uh, a negative connotation, but we are trying to demystify that. So you keep your credentials in your digital wallet, and I'll show you how, and you own the original copy in a digital format. So that's a, that's a new thing that uh, feels, feels a, bit, a bit different. Uh, obviously, the digital format could be in your wallet on your phone. So that's also a breakthrough in terms of, you know, transparency towards students. Um, initial assumptions. My credentials are a form of credentials which represent competencies, skills, and learning outcomes derived from assessment-based non-degree activities and specify a location for evidence of the content of the earned achievement. And the clearinghouse is an entity form to facilitate the exchange of transactions and stands between two clearing entities or participants, right? So it's a shaking hands type of thing. Um, we've got a user interface, which needed to be clear, have a form, have a function, uh, and make sense for a lot of people, right? And Within the clearinghouse, we've got um, different permission levels, and currently we've got three um, uh, codem avatars. You've got the main admin, the university admin, and the student. These are three profiles that we identified that we've got in the clearinghouse as ownership of stuff. We're gonna have two scenarios, right? So one will be creating an achievement, a compound achievement, right? And the other one will be requesting a credential. And I'll speak later about what's the difference between an achievement and a credential. Um, moving onwards, um, we can create within the clearing house a structure, uh, a dependency or a codependency or a must dependency. So you've got at the bottom here, you would have competencies. So these could be micro credentials in our case, right? Uh, the competence of developing um, a teamwork um, perspective on things. And then you could build this on into a course or into a second course, and you can build that onwards into a master's program. So the clearinghouse would allow you to issue micro credentials that, that um, would um, fit a master program, but all the way down granularly in, in a stackable way. So if you don't have competence two done, 
and competence 17 done, you cannot have the master's program finished and issued as a digital credential, right? So we are out of beta in testing mode. We are live, technically connected, uh, technically connected to the blockchain. We are using an API. So that's in tech speak. That means we can connect hundreds, if not thousands, of universities across Europe. Um, and it allows us to issue credentials in the real world. So soon we are also supporting Europass. So what does this mean, right? Um, if you request something in the clearinghouse now, you'll also get it, um, um, get it done, get it delivered. Uh, we use secure wallet for both admins and students. You cannot have a person without a secure wallet in the clearinghouse. Um, we store the credentials in that wallet. Um, the wallet is a standard application for your browser. It's called MetaMask. Um, and everyone has a profile, right? And the credential can be shared on a social uh, network, which is missing there as a comment. I've got a load of other stuff, but I'm, what I'm doing is I'm not showing you this because it doesn't make sense. What I'll do is I'll go out and I'll share with you a link to the, um, to the, to the set of slides that we are um, showing now so you can, you can work that out on your own right there so these slides would allow you to have um the first chunk which is the presentation should be fine then you can go through uh, the registration and the profile and the onboarding into the clearing house on your own and obviously you've got our emails so you can call us up and then we've got additional slides if they're helpful for you with um, uh, mainly the blockchain thing uh, uh, described. So this is the first part of what I would like to show you. Um, are there any questions at this point? There were no questions so far. That's almost impossible. Somebody has to have a question. I think we're getting to that part. Someone is doubting out there, I know. I'm joking. So let's let's kick it off. Uh, before that, let me also show you that the um, the European Commission um, um, was the the, the Europass actually issued a a based on our work a set of specs. Um, should be somewhere. Um, probably this one. Yes. So let me drop this into the chat as well. Um, I've got a question. I see who can use from Garcave? Who can use the clinic house as badges issuer? I'm interested to learn more. Anyone, essentially anyone at this point, any institution. Um, we can talk more or you can ask more questions um, through the microphone, should be fine. So just for you to know that the Europass digital credentials infrastructure, as I'm showing it here, um, is basically as well has elements of the micro HE work. So this is worth reading. And the majority of this stuff has been also developed in technical terms. So I'm not going to go through this, um, but it is something that you should be looking at. So this, this should be the future. I'm not saying that what the European Commission is saying should be done, but it will probably be pushed through in a couple of, you know, X, Y, Z years or months. Um, I think we should go off and do the demo, right? Michaela, are you happy with that? Yeah, absolutely, Davor. Uh, maybe before um, you start a new uh, chapter of your presentation, uh, there's a question from Corinne um, oh, right. related to your uh, answer of uh, that everyone can use the um, technology and institution. She's asking if uh, it, that also goes for the outside of Europe. 
Mm. Oh, I see now, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Ildiko yeah, so Il Ildiko, Ildiko, Ildiko pitched in. So yes, yeah. Okay. And there's another question, if you're looking at it, uh, from Brian Mulligan. Yeah. Uh, it says, I noticed that the student effort was one of the par parameter, uh, parameters. Sorry. Uh, is this optional or does it conflict with the idea of competency being disconnected from seat time? <laughs> okay. It's probably a multi-layer multi question. Um, yeah. It's connected to seat time, I think. So there's a couple of there's a couple of things. So once we once we started developing the clearing house, or should I say this? Um, once we started de developing this, it we were basically clueless about how the the clearing house should look like. By look like, I mean what would be the best way to present this? What would be the best? interface to present to um, students, uh, admins, faculty, and so on. So the student effort and the sitting time became the mobility of, of the thing uh, became very apparent to us. So that's why we kind of decided once as since we are doing this, we might as well just do it properly. So we came out of the um, prototype mode into something that is now almost a finished product, uh, tested by a couple of universities outside of the consortium, but also inside. So almost like a mini spin-off. Um, I think we've got Vesna on the call uh, from Slovenia. She's working with the DOBA faculty, and we, we piloted with her. Maybe she can share a couple of things later on. But the idea was that, yeah, students were at the kind of at the core of it, of the user experience, which was not a topic of the project itself. Um. Okay, Davor, I think... Uh, we we'll just move on and just... Yeah, she's, so yeah. we Thank you, Ildiko. Uh, so maybe yeah. we'll continue with the presentation. Let's just kick it off with this thing, yeah. So, so I've got two... Um, I've got two screens, right? So I'm going to kill this off, and I've got two screens of the same. On the right-hand side, I've got myself as a student, hopefully, when I log in, and I urge you to log in as well. And on the left-hand side, I'm logged in as, um, as an admin. So I'm the super admin on the left, and I'm the student on the right. So when I come into Credentify, obviously I get a welcome, but I'm, I'm requested to go to my institutions or go to my achievements, right? On the left-hand side, I've got my achievements, I've got my credentials, users, and institutions. And I'll tell you why I've got institutions and users. It's because when you log, when you first log into Credentify, and you've got the details on the slides, we will ask you to log in to choose a role. One role is a for student, for teacher, and for... Um, Admin. Now, admin is the admin of your institution. The teacher is a teacher at any institution, and the student is a student at any institution. So you come in, right? I pop in as a student. Let me, share, let me make this bigger. Pop in as a student. I've got all of these institutions in Credentify, and I choose which I want to be engaged with. So. David, can you please zoom in on your Oh, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Is this better? Even more. Even more. Right, right. No problems. Okay, thank you. Right. So I'm a student at this university, which is coincidentally our um, coordinator. Um, I'm an admin at Josef Stefan. I'm a student at Tempere, and I'm a student at the Belgium campus IT University. And I'm probably something more. Yeah, I'm, I'm just that. Um, so what, the reason why is because we are trying to solve the problem of multiple institutions creating one credential or one achievement, right? And this is the this this is something that follows the idea of the Erasmus Plus mobility. Um, if I go for my institutions, I see them here. I see my roles, right? I let's say I want to be with the Josef Stefan, so I pop in, right? I see the members there. These are the members that are 
within JSI. I have my overview. Uh, I can delete this institution and I can update my institution. I can, you know, just type in whatever I want and I say update and it's updated. Um, these are the users, the users that I'm also um, being in charge of because I'm uh, an admin. If I go back, I'm an admin at DHBV Tampere, uh, DHBV, right? sorry, the Joseph Stefan, right? So I'm just one, sorry. Um, so these are the same people that are in the JSI thing. And I can see achievements on this tab from Tampere, DHBV, um, Joseph Stefan, and where Joseph Stefan is also involved, right? And the combinations of, um, I can see all of these achievements. I can also create a new achievement. Um, just to show you quickly, um, if you're looking at this form, what you're looking at essentially is the metadata standard um, um, done in a different way um, so that it fits the application. But it's basically the metadata standard, right? So I can type in, I can, I can create one, and then I'm off. At the same time, I've got my credential tabs. So as the last tab that I'm describing, I've got all credentials listed from um, from the people that I'm uh, that I'm managing as admin, right? And I've got my credentials here, the credentials that I've asked for. Um, and if I go for this one, for example, which is complete, I can click on it. And obviously, my name is Sophia Loren. This is how I'm logged in at the moment. And I've got my details from my achievement. So achievement can be anything. Uh, and we just shape it in that way. And then I've got the credential metadata um, fully uh, this is a very, very good example. It's fully described here. Um, if I go back, I mentioned that we are storing this on a blockchain. So if I say show blockchain transaction, this is how the digital version of the digital credential looks like, right? If I say click more, then I've got, um, then I've got this is my encrypted credentials. So the difference between what we did and what other players in the field did is that we have put all of the credential on the blockchain. So this is this is that. Not just the shortcut, so to speak. So we're not sa saving Can you please zoom in again? Okay. okay. Sure, sorry. I've got this thing that is coming up from actually the zoom. So just make it bigger, right? So this is a test blockchain. It's not public. Um, and I've got, this is what I've been showing. This is the codified um, the codified file of my credential. And then I've got all of the other specs. As you can see, this is the credentify here. I wouldn't want to go into details on this, but if you have questions, let me know. And we've got our software people at Knowledge for All who can answer to all of these details. I wouldn't be paying a lot of attention on this, uh, but it is something uh, that adds value. So if I go back and I go for the achievements, um, as I've shown you, I can create a new one, right? Um, um, and, and there it is. And then I choose you as a Stefan because I'm an admin. Um, my credential, it's a tag. And then essentially I can connect this with other uh, digital credentials so anything can be a digital credential in this in this environment either it can consist of so this one can consist of something else or it can consist of probably not the best words but we're still experimenting and then hopefully if I want to I can create a new achievement and there I have it right there right so this would be an admin from any institution could create an achievement like that um, so that's that's on this side. Are there any questions at this point? I see a lot of uh, activities in the chat, but I but I'm not really uh, but I'm I not can, really paying attention. Yeah, I can get a hangout. Uh, so Ildigo is pitching in, and there's two unanswered questions. One is from Brian Mulligan, say, asking, 
uh, does putting the full credential on the blockchain have an implication for cost in the longer term? Um, that's a very good question, Ryan. I think, so we haven't done the, the full uh, financial costs yet, but I think the answer would be that it would be cheaper rather than more expensive. Um, if you would have more on the blockchain, then probably it, it, it would show on, on the final financial statement in general. No, no, I'm not kidding. It's, I'll, I can share this with you later on. Uh, because this is not g getting crunched further. Um, and it's also a closed system. In terms of the achievement on LinkedIn, yes, it is shareable. I can show one. Um, but I would have to go, um, if I quickly show something. So these are my credentials. Uh, so this is my credential, right? So we have a very small tool. If I come in and I want to verify so the way this functions is that if somebody wants to verify a credential, it verifies it with us. So I click it on, on it, and I've got all of my details right there taken out, and I want to verify this credential. So let me show you first, and then it'll make more sense. So Oxert is an external partner that we are working with. All of this stuff is open source, so can be reused, so no worries. So the, the verifier says that the asset is valid. The asset is, in this context, our digital credential, a digital asset. So if I want to go for the, and, and this is the, the details, I can make it a bit bigger. These are the details of the, again, of the credential. So this is something for us to see. The outside world doesn't see all of this, uh, all of this data. So if I go for the embed, um, I can gen generate a QR code. I have it here. We've got this is the part where we are trying to fill in the partner's logo. So this should be the university's logo in the in the in the right there in the in the middle of the QR code. So I download this, save it. Go for the desktop. Um, it is a bit clanky, I know, but it does work. So I have my, um, I've got my QR code right there. So I can post this on LinkedIn. I can, if I go back, I can generate a URL and I can post this URL and this and QR code on LinkedIn, and then hopefully the magic would happen. You can scan that with your phone. So you see a candidate on um, LinkedIn, you scan with your phone his QR code, and it says that he really did it, that he really did that, uh, so that he achieved that credential, uh, and you're vouching for it with this um, verifiable technology. So this is our answer to the problem of uh, verifying things. Um, so I could go back, just take this away, and maybe show you a bit more of what we've got. Um, so we created this, um, this micro-credential, right? So we could come in. Let me show you just how the request is made. Obviously, we can update this achievement, right? Go back. I can request, obviously delete it, and I can request it, right? So this request has been sent to the admin. Uh, and if I go in the other space, I should see this as the admin, I should see it. This request, right. So I see this request as the super admin, I could show it in the other window because I'm admin also there, but it doesn't matter. Um, so I see this request, right? See it right there. And I say, accept request from Sophia Loren, the student. Yeah. So I said, grade achieved. I say, whatever, grade 10. Credits awarded. I say one, because it's a micro-credential. So this is one ECTS. Um, Expiry period, I'd say, you know, um, I could say 
until you know end of October but I could as well say you know this is 20 32 36 just for the fun of it 37 and well cheating I would say not apply this was an optional thing. and I say credential passed right I'm about to confirm this yes And now, hopefully, this thing is being crunched, right? Oh, sorry. Yeah, so it's it's crunching. If you see on your right-hand side, this, ah, crap, sorry. Uh, it's getting issued. Now, if I go back for the student side, we'll probably, hopefully, if it works, usually during presentation, everything fails. Um, but I could refresh this and go for the student side. And right, and it says that it's issuing my digital credential right there. And when it crunches it, then I'll be able to show you what I've shown you before for the previous one. I could show you where it's stored on the blockchain and so on. Um, so that's, I think, that. And if I go as a super admin, obviously this is GDPR kosher, but you know, this is a presentation. So I've got three new requests um, from Stefan, probably a bit more down. Um, but the idea I think would be that this software uh, should solve a problem for teachers and faculty. And the way it would solve problems is that it should be uh, um, implemented into the workflow of the registry office or implemented into the workflow of uh, you know the university itself or of the program and then through an API so that you people would not be using uh, one more interface um, but they would be using this um, ubiquitously through other tools that they have um, either Moodle or anything else. Um, and I think, I think this should be it for now. If there are any questions. Thank you, Davor. Uh, sorry, may I have one? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So I stopped sharing, uh, but if there's need for more sharing, I'll share more. Uh, thank you, Davor. It was very clean and, and clear cut. My only question is that uh, how do you differentiate in this clearing house between a very concrete instance of a micro financial owned by a specific person and yeah. the general definition of the micro financial that can be uh, earned by 10,000 persons uh, after each other or parallel or anything like that? Right, I mean, right. so, that yeah. I mean, if there is a short course on the marketing for I don't know what purpose and that sort of short course is delivered uh, in three different universities and they all would like to issue the same uh, credential, I mean the same content of the credential and it will be earned by different persons. That's actually a very good is, question, yeah. This is a, you know, it's a general definition and all instances are just owned by the learner who achieved this. What I'm trying, yeah, hmm? I'm, I'm trying to find, there was, uh, so with Vesna from Doba, we did create that scenario. So we had five institutions, they have created their own one, one credential. So you ask specifically for micro credentials, but yeah. they have created one credential which they shared and then they, uh, through their admins, each admin of each university uh, then approved to their own cohorts of students um, that specific credential um, because the students from University A could see the credential, the students from University B could see the credential and it wouldn't be mixed, right? Because when they came into the clearinghouse, they actually ticked that they want to be um, members 
of one institution or that they are members of one institution, right? Because students are always, they have their native institution and then, you know, they can probably, if I would come into an application like this, I would say, you know, so I'm, I'm a graduate of UCL, so I would probably click UCL and I would probably click, you know, MIT or Ljubljana or something else just for the fun of it, just to try it. Um, so we didn't have that scenario, but if I simply share my screen again, the idea for the, I'm not sure where to share my screen anymore. All right. Um, the idea for the, how to have a differentiation is if I pop in here, um, and I go for the achievements and I add one achievement. Now, what we figured out would be a very good separator from different types of credentials, including micro credentials, and within micro credentials, other credentials is the tags. So I could say, you know, I could say, um, not diploma, but you know. Economics, um, um, MA, the, well, yeah, I mean, let's say, Digital Humanities MA, and then I would say, okay, I would select institution, use of Stephanie in this uh, particular instance, and then I would say, you know, program, um, yeah. um, okay. micro-credential, and so on. So with these tags, if I have 10,000 credentials, then I can cluster them, then I can understand, this is phase two, which, um, which belong to which cluster, and then I can differentiate different types of, right, and how they, and then I can, then I can even, if somebody would come in and type in, rather than digital humanities, they would say, you know, digital law, um, then I could have a recommendation in the tags which would pull out, you know, uh, you would you want to create a micro credential, you want to create a program that would have micro credentials in it? Is it something else? So we're trying to experiment. We don't really know how, what is the best option, but we are getting input from different stakeholders within the project and outside of the project for that. Uh, so hopefully we can uh, we can polish this idea. Okay, thank you. I believe we might have time for one more question. Um, and uh, I've, I've also shared the link to the uh, Google form which we set up. Uh, so please get in touch with us with any questions or if you'd like to be informed about any new developments, um, I invite you to click on the link and get in touch with us. Uh, so maybe just one more question. Um, I, Michaela, I would like to have Visna if she wants to comment because she has used the thing. So she can say best whether it makes sense or not. I mean, from a user point of view, because she's been involved with uh, a very simple thing, a hackathon, and then we were designing how do we issue a micro credential or a digital credential for that purpose. And it was not an easy task, to be honest. We had to change a lot of things. Um, but Yes, hello. If you I want guess. to pitch in, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I got muted. Thank you. Hello. Um, yes, uh, thank you for inviting me to share my experiences. Uh, it was really uh, a good experience for us. Uh, we were facing the same challenge as um, uh, it was mentioned a little bit before that uh, we are working on international projects. Uh, it was called Hackathon and we wanted to issue a credential for this project and by more institutions. We were from five institutions from different countries. So, um, and this application really enabled us to to try that and uh, also to try this organization of uh, students from each institution, how they applied, uh, requested the credential, how we together prepared the achievement, all institutions, because uh, each country has some specifics or regarding the credits and credit systems and so on. So they were able to update it from their side as well. Um, uh, it, it was interesting to observe the whole process um, 
from the uh, preparing the achievement than how students uh, perceive the uh, the application. Uh, we found out that it's very intuitive when they start. They didn't really have man many questions. And uh, also um, partners as institutions when they were preparing or updating it. Um, and at the end, the, the same thing that you already asked before, also students ask how they can use it for, for their CVs or LinkedIn and so on. So this was the same, how, what we could share with them with QR code or, or, or um, URL um, link. So um, yeah, it is still um, uh, really exciting to see how uh, we will be all together be able to develop this further and how the whole um, ecosystem uh, for micro credentials will develop so that it will really be possible for the future for students uh, and for institutions and for employers to use it. Um, I really think this is the future. So really uh, thank you to all that you are putting your hard work into this project and making it work and uh, developing it. So from my side, and if any questions, please feel welcome to ask or contact me. I mean, maybe just one comment. Mm -hmm. the, the idea of micro-credentials is very solid, I think. I mean, th this is my personal opinion, not even professional. Um, it does make sense. The mm -hmm. problem that I see is that European universities are, to a certain degree, very much risk averse. They wouldn't want to um, and I wouldn't, if I would be, you know, in management, I wouldn't want to include any type of of technology that would allow people, you know, to to work more or to receive more questions from students or even students to question or even to open the whole debate of why are we doing this. Um, but I think I think times might be changing even with the argument of the uh, COVID nineteen thing. Um, but in, but just for the sake for the sake of having European technologies for European universities and European students, it would just be a shame not to use it or at least test it. Um, that's my opinion. I mean, we can always piggyback behind the Americans, which is true. Um, but then again, if we have our own stuff, it might be well worth trying it, at least. I'm not saying that Credentify is the answer for that, obviously, but people should be more risk averse and and see whether they can fiddle with with technologies that are you know newly built and and out there ready to use thank you davor these are great words to finish this session on and thank you vesna for your input and for your encouraging okay. words and participation in exploring this technology uh we have quite a lot of questions um and about two minutes finish to finish so we can't address them all so please feel free to get in touch with us um, over the Google form, as I said, and we're going to try to uh, get back to everyone. Um, so I'd just like to use this last minute to thank Eden for putting effort into uh, organizing this uh, organizing this conference to be an experience as an on-site conference. Uh, thank you, Timothy, for backstage support. Thank you, Ildiko, for pitching in. And um, uh, There's some links in the chat. Double, yeah, you wanted to say. Sure, just, just one thing. So, don't. So, the clearinghouse does not issue uh, any credentials on its behalf, right? So, the clearinghouse is a tool that allows other players to issue through it credentials. That's that's the idea, right? So, it's not that, that, that there's no point in us issuing anything. We are just there to facilitate the issuing in between. Uh, institutions. I'm saying this because I'm I'm quickly going through the the comments that I didn't see before. So the idea is to really empower the universities and the students rather than you know having a standalone technology that that has no meaning or no usability whatsoever. Yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you, Davor. Um, uh, we really hope to uh, hear from you. Uh, we are going to publish the slides and also yeah with the the presentation will be online so we can get all the links and uh, hope to hear from you all again. Thank you for participating. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.